Good morning. morning. Welcome to God's house on the sixth Sunday of Easter. The service that we'll be following this morning is the service of the word, focusing on simply the Holy Spirit as our comforter. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. We have come into the presence of God, who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all of your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. Now may God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. In the peace of that forgiveness, let us now praise the Lord. Father of lights, every good and perfect gift comes from you. Inspire us to think those things that are true and long for those things that are good, that we may always make our petitions according to your gracious will. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The first lesson for this morning comes from the book of Acts, chapter 17, beginning at verse 22. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship, and this is what I am going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and Perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. This is the word of our God. We join in singing Psalm 66. You'll find that on page 90.
second lesson is taken from 1 John chapter 3, beginning at verse 13. Do not be surprised, my brothers, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life in him. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. This is the word of our God. Please stand for the gospel. The Holy Gospel is recorded in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, beginning at verse 15, which will also serve as our sermon text for this morning. Jesus says, If you love me, you will obey what I command. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I too will love him and show myself to him. This is the gospel of our Lord.
Grace and mercy and peace are yours from God our Heavenly Father, through his Son and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. We're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves actually into about two weeks from now because next week we celebrate Ascension. The following week we, we celebrate the, the, the coming of the Holy Spirit. And, and, and this text really talks a lot about the Holy Spirit, but there's plenty of, of things to talk about when it comes to the Holy Spirit. So today we'll, we'll just start to get into the work of the Holy Spirit this morning with Jesus' words when he says, I'm going to send you a different counselor, a different comforter. He is the Holy Spirit. Dear brothers and dear sisters in Christ Jesus, who is our Lord and our Savior, the one who brings us comfort, the one who sends us his comforter, the Holy Spirit. What gives you comfort in your life? For, I'm, I'm guessing that for every different person and depending on what circumstance you are in your life and what stage of life you're going through, there are different things that give different people comfort. I'm guessing if I asked a two-year-old and that two-year-old was able to express his or her feelings, you know what comfort would be? Sitting in mom or dad's lap, maybe with the blanket, favorite blanket in his or her arms, reading a book. That might be what a, a two-year-old gets when it talks about comfort. What about an elderly person who is homebound or living in a, a nursing home, long-term care facility? You know what gives a person like that comfort? I'll tell you because I visit enough of them regularly. When son or daughter or grandson or granddaughter or somebody takes the time out of their busy schedules to come and spend an hour talking with them. Nothing else. They don't want anything else. They don't need presents. They don't need money. But they love it. And they take comfort when somebody gives them the time of day to come and speak and talk and have a conversation with them for, for a couple of hours or an hour on a day. You know what gives a, a parent comfort? When a parent has maybe been struggling financially for, for years, kids are growing up, <clears throat> wondering when are we ever going to not have to worry about finances? When that day comes and God blesses that person with the financial ability to help kids when the kids need it. Or sometimes simply having the kids home safe and sound in the bed at night. That gives a parent with kids growing up a whole lot of comfort. The, the reason I, I, I bring up those situations and the reason I even bring the question up is that if you would have read these verses from John chapter 14 25 years ago, you would have heard not counselor but comforter. And that's what I remember as a kid growing up. I remember these verses and, and really all of the Old Testament or the Old, Old New Testament verses that talk about the Holy Spirit translated the comforter. In the Greek, it's paraclete or parakletos, but they always used to translate it the comforter. I will send another comforter to you. His name is the Holy Spirit. Now it's translated counselor, which is just as good or maybe even a little bit better translation. But for our intents and purposes this morning, we're going to focus on the comfort aspect of the Holy Spirit and, and, and the comfort that the Holy Spirit brings to people. Again, it depends on the situation. It depends on the circumstances of life. Everybody takes comfort in different ways. But whether you think that you need comfort or where you, whether you swear you don't need comfort, this is one comfort that you do need. Don't care whether you think you don't need it. God tells you that this is the comfort that you need. And this is the comfort that comes through faith in Christ Jesus, given to us by the Holy Spirit. It, it comes through faith in Christ. And, and, and what is it simply? Christ has lived for you. And then Christ gave his life for you. And then Christ rose again for you. And then Christ promises the one promise that hasn't been fulfilled yet but will be someday, I will come back again for you to bring you home to be in heaven where you belong. And that comfort is yours through faith in Christ Jesus. We, we know that Jesus Christ is our comfort. <clears throat> and we take comfort in the fact that our sins are forgiven in Christ Jesus. For, for God so loved the world that he gave his son. And on him, Jesus Christ, was laid the iniquity of us all. 
But in the verses before us this morning, from John chapter 14, Jesus says, I'm leaving you now. My, my, my physical presence, you're not going to be able to ask me and, 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 and give my comfort, but I'm going to send you a different comforter. I'm going to introduce you to the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, who is often called the comforter in God's word. So, so the question is, why did Jesus give us his Holy Spirit? What was the purpose for Jesus to say, I'm going to ask the Father and he will give you another comforter, another counselor, the Holy Spirit, very simply, to bring us to faith. Secondly, to help us to see that Jesus is still very much with us, his presence is still with us, and finally, to produce in us a life that is consistent with what we call ourselves, Christians. A, a life that is characterized by good works. You know, these verses follow very, very closely on the heels of last week's gospel lesson, John chapter 14, verses 1 through 12 or 1 through 14, where Jesus sees the, the concern that his disciples are, are showing when Jesus says, I'm not going to be with you forever. As a matter of fact, I'm leaving. I'm going to die tomorrow. And, and, and the comfort or the, 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 the discontent and the uneasiness on the, on the faces of those disciples, Jesus had to do something about. So he began last week by saying, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. And then he goes on. He says, you know where I'm going. When he was asked, no, I don't know where you're going. Then he says, you sure do. And I will tell you that I'm going to heaven to prepare a place for you. And if I do that, I'm going to come back someday and bring you to be with you, with me in heaven someday. So that was the beginning of, of, of Jesus' comfort. But now he says, I'm going to send you a comforter into your life for the rest of your years on this earth. And he is going to bring you the same kind of comfort that I have brought you for these past three years. Because he was their comforter for the past three years. Remember the disciples' ministry with Jesus? Public ministry, three years. From the time that Jesus was baptized at 30 years old to the time that Jesus was crucified at 33 years old, Jesus was the one that talked to them. Jesus was the one that, that spent time with those disciples. Jesus was the one that unfolded scripture to them. Jesus was the one that, you got problems, come to me, and I will help you deal with those problems, with, with your faith. But now Jesus says, I'm leaving, but I'm going to send you some comfort. His name is the Holy Spirit. This is what he says. I'm going to ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor, another comforter, to be with you forever. The Spirit of truth. That's truly what he is, the Holy Spirit, isn't he? Because the Holy Spirit uses God's word. And what is God's word other than truth? The truth of God's law that convicts us of our sins. And says, you don't deserve anything because of what you are by nature and what you do every day of your lives. He convicts us of the sins. It cuts our hearts as the people were cut to the heart on Pentecost. But then, just when people are led to the brink of despair and saying, what hope is there for me? The wages of sin is death. I'm sinful. I, I must have to die in hell. Then the Holy Spirit uses the gospel, the spirit of truth. And what is the gospel other than Jesus Christ? In baptism, in the Lord's Supper, in the pages of God's holy word. That's the spirit of truth. That's what the Holy Spirit uses, the truth of God's word to convict us and to bring us then to faith. Now, when Jesus promised to send his Holy Spirit in the form of the Holy Spirit to his disciples, the comfort in the form of the Holy Spirit, it, it, it's safe to say that those disciples still had some issues. Again, they were confronted with this this terrible news that Jesus was not going to be with them anymore. Still sad, still distressed, and still depressed. I'm leaving you. But just as he says that, he continues to tell them about the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit would do for them. And that when he sends the Holy Spirit, it wasn't as if he was abandoning them. He says in the next verse, verse 18, I will not leave you as orphans. A word that we don't use very often anymore, but back in the day, people knew what orphans were. 
Mom and dad are not in the picture. And so the child is left without anybody to care for them, anybody to take care of them at all. And so the states put up orphanages, which were run by the states and the federal government sometimes to provide the means necessary for bringing a child up from young age to 18 years old when they were then put out on on their own. Jesus says, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm not going to abandon you. You might think that I'm abandoning you, but I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. He says, before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me because I live, you also will live. Now, how can Jesus say in one breath, I'm leaving you, but then in the same breath, he says, I'm not really leaving you. What what, what does that mean? He gave them the Holy Spirit, which is the triune God, just as Jesus was. And, and, And what does the Holy Spirit want and love to do more than anything else? Does the Holy Spirit love to talk about himself? Sometimes we, in catechism class, we talk about the, the Holy Spirit as the shy person of the Trinity. This is the person that we hardly ever hear about. One Sunday, usually, we give to the Holy Spirit, and that's on Pentecost, right? The coming of the Holy Spirit. And, and then we get right back to Jesus or, or, or God the Father. But that's who the Holy Spirit is. The Holy Spirit loves to talk about Jesus, The Holy Spirit was the one that inspired God's word and says, what is this word about? It's about Jesus Christ, the one who forgives your sins. The Holy Spirit is never happier than when he can bring people to faith in Christ Jesus, not bring people to to talk about him all the time, but testifying to Jesus Christ. When, When Jesus ascended back into heaven, it doesn't mean that we have a hole in our lives where Jesus once was. No, Jesus says the Holy Spirit is going to fill that hole. And every time you open up your Bible, and every time that you come to the Lord's table, and every time you bring a child to that baptismal font, the Holy Spirit is working to create and to strengthen and to confirm that faith. So those two reasons why Jesus sent us the Holy Spirit. First of all, to bring us to faith. Then also to make us understand that he was not abandoning us as orphans. And then finally, he brings us the Holy Spirit. He gives us the comfort of the Holy Spirit so that we might live in consistency with our name as Christians to produce in us a life of love. As Christians, we know that we have forgiveness in Christ Jesus. We know that God has placed us on the road to heaven, right? We all know that. But does it sometimes happen when you come to God's house and you pray and you sing your praises and you offer your thanks to God in form of, of offerings and your, your prayers and your praises, you, you leave church and you're still wondering, eh, where's the comfort that I was hoping to get there? Sometimes I, I talk about the fact that when you come into church, you're at this level, but when you leave church, and, and, and you've just heard about what Christ has done for you. You shouldn't be leaving on a, on a higher level. Your, your, your steps should be a little bit quicker. There should be more of a bounce in your step. But sometimes, and I think it's true for everybody, that's not always true, is it? Do we always leave God's house after spending an hour in God's presence? Do we always leave with the same comfort that we're looking for when we come to church? Again, I think everyone does at that time once in a while. There is something more to the Christian life than simply knowing that we've been forgiven and knowing that we have a home in heaven. What, what is that one thing that we're looking for sometimes? Living a life of good works. Sometimes downplayed in the Lutheran church because we put so much emphasis on what Christ has done for us. A, a good emphasis, yes. But then we think then we can live the way that we want to. We can talk the way that we want to. We can do whatever we want to in this life because God's forgiven us. Who cares what I do? I'll be forgiven on Sunday morning. Jesus expects more of that from us. 
more of, of, of what he wants from us, and, and that is a life of good works. He wants us to produce works that are in keeping with what we are and what we have been given. Sometimes when we lack comfort in our life, it's because we lack the kind of life that pleases God. The, the life that says, God, I am living for you. I'm going to go out of this church, and for the rest of this week, I have been motivated, and I have been empowered to speak in a way that tells people that I'm a Christian, and act in a way that tells people I'm a Christian, and just live my whole life for my kids, and for my spouse, and in front of my coworkers at work. People are going to know that I am a Christian. How is that? In verse 17, Jesus says, The world cannot accept him, talking about the Holy Spirit, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him because he lives in you and will be in you. Which kind of reminds us of what St. Paul said in 1 Corinthians when he was talking about the temple of the Holy Spirit. Don't you understand that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit? You're not your own. You were bought at a very tremendous steep price. Jesus blood. Therefore, Paul says, honor God with your body, which means what comes out of your mouth and what you do with your hands and what you allow to be seen with your eyes and what you allow to be heard with your ears. Honor God with your body. That's why the Holy Spirit lives in us, to guide us into more God-pleasing living. So if we're not getting the comfort from God's house and God's word that we think we should be getting, maybe it's simply because we're spending more time trying to drive him out of our lives than welcoming him into our hearts. How does that happen? When we find it really, really easy to hold grudges against our neighbors, neighbors but we find it extremely difficult to forgive when somebody has forgiven or when somebody has sinned against us. We just took a look at the Lord's Prayer in, in, in seventh grade confirmation class, and, and the question was, so how many times are we supposed to forgive our neighbors? Is it the seven times that Jesus was asked, or is it the 70 times seven, or is it the 77 times? The point was, and that was not the answer, as often as it takes. That's how much we should be willing to forgive in our lives. When we find it very easy to find any kind of excuse not to come here on a regular basis and hear God's word and, and, and be able to praise and praise and, and pray to him, when our mouths sound more like the proverbial sailor on the shipyard docks than a Christian, then we're spending a whole lot of time trying to drive Jesus or the Holy Spirit out of our hearts then putting out the welcome mat for him. It, it's, it's common sense, isn't it? If you were to come to church on a Sunday morning and you find, found a pile of garbage, stinky, smelly garbage, trying to get through that to get into God's house, I'm guessing we'd have a whole lot less people coming to church. Because if you knew that you had to walk through this and live through that smell during the course of the church service, you wouldn't want to come. Same thing with the Holy Spirit. Does the Holy Spirit want to live in a heart that is full of the garbage of our sin? No. And that's why Jesus begins these verses and ends with the same verses. He says, if you love me, you will obey what I command. Then, whoever has my commands and obeys them, that's the one who loves me. You want to show your love to God? Obey his commandments. Children, if you want to show your love to your parents, do what they tell you to do. There, there's three different reasons that the Holy Spirit is sent to comfort us, Jesus says. One is to bring us to faith and to keep us in that faith. The second one is to make us understand that he's not abandoned us. Come two weeks from now when, when Jesus, or next week when we celebrate Ascension and we say goodbye to Jesus' physical presence, the very next week we come back to God's house and we say, and we hear, Jesus says, I will send you the Holy Spirit. Go to Jerusalem, just wait for him, and I will send you the Holy Spirit. 
But then the last one is to show your life that the Holy Spirit has worked in you. He's worked in you your faith. Now show that you are one of God's children. So our prayer, may God continue to give us the Holy Spirit so that his comfort may be in us forever. Amen. The peace of God which goes beyond our understanding will guard and keep your hearts and your minds in the true faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We join in our common confession with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, you never fail to listen and, to, and attend to your children when we come to you in prayer. In a world where so many worship false gods, both known and unknown, give us a bold proclamation of Jesus Christ as we give the reason for the hope that we have in him. O Lord, we pray for the government and all those who protect us. Strengthen, strengthen them and uphold them as they go about their duties with wisdom and integrity. We pray for the lonely, the poor, and the homeless. Grant them companionship, food, and shelter. As your people, may we be your hands and feet in love for all of our neighbors. We pray for all those who are in need of relief, including our members Lori Higgins, Marion Watalowitz, Roy Grunewald, Gail Kurtz, and all of whom, all of whom are dealing with health challenges. 
comfort them with your Holy Spirit, and provide healing and restoration according to your gracious will. We pray for our congregation and all those who are taught your word here. Keep our lives from slipping into sin or unbelief. May we always think and act and live lives that praise you in all the world. Almighty God, we thank you for giving your Son to be our Redeemer. Now send your Holy Spirit to testify to Jesus and to keep us in the true faith. Keep us strong and steadfast until you deliver us to heavenly glory. Hear us as we also offer you our personal prayers. All these things, and whatever else you would have us pray for, we ask in the name of him who is the resurrection and the life, Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, Please stand for our closing prayer. O Lord God, our Heavenly Father, pour out the Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us strong in your grace and truth. Protect and comfort us in all temptation and bestow on us your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another and serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace. Amen.
Welcome to God's house again on this sixth Sunday in the season of Easter. Just a couple of more weeks and then we head into that long green season of Pentecost, that growing season. Um, But two really important days between that, um, Ascension, which will be celebrated next week, and then Pentecost, which we'll be celebrating the following week after that, the first Sunday in in June. Um, One thing that will be kind of tagged on with next week is since it's Memorial Day weekend, and I don't know how long they've done this. Ralph, do you know how long has the Allenton Legion been coming up to all the cemeteries? 50 years. 50 years? Longer than, actually, that's as long as I've been around. Um, but but a long time, a very, very long time. And, and so they will be with us once again this coming uh, Sunday at 10.15. They, they hope to be here, and we should be plenty um, done by that time because even though we've got a communion service next week, um, there will be plenty of time for us to be finished with our worship service and then head out in the cemetery. And if again, if you've never been out there for, for just a really short, brief ceremony, but it's the visual um, being out in the cemetery, flags flying on uh, on graves, flag flying with the with the Allenton Legion there. The the, the sound of the of the shots um, just brings us a, a really good visual of what Memorial Day is all about. It's not just a day off on on a Monday, but it's 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 more than that. It's we, we remember those who have worn the uniform and, and especially those who have who have paid that that uh, that sacrifice with their lives. Um, so that's next Sunday after the late service, about 10.15 in the in the uh, cemetery. The uh, people that we prayed for, the members that we prayed for, two of them have, have recently come home. Roy Grinwald is now home, happy and happy and grumpy at the same time. Um, he's a good old German, um, but he's happy to be home, I'm sure. But Roy is back, but in still need of of your prayers. Also, Marian Witalowicz is not home, um, but she moved yesterday, or on Friday afternoon to a long-term care facility, um, trying to battle getting that infection out of her foot. Um, Gail Kurtz continues to undergo chemotherapy treatments, and Lori Higgins suffered a stroke um, several days ago, been in the hospital ICU, and now she's in a regular room. But please keep her in your prayers, especially as she goes through a, probably a long, long-term um, recovery from that stroke. The other things, we could use some church cleaners. There's not a whole lot of people that are signed up for the church cleaning during the four months of the summer. Um, that's up on the bulletin board. The thing that is not on the bulletin board yet is the pastor and the teacher assignments from MLC and the seminary. That will be soon. I could not find the the pastor assignment list, but that'll be up next weekend. Um, if you if you uh, at this point time of the year, sometimes people are thinking about spring cleaning. I know my wife is talking about spring cleaning and doing a little bit here and there. But uh, um, if you if you've always wanted to do a rummage sale. Miss Jackson and Campbellsport this past weekend, um, but don't want to go through the trouble of that and want your things and, and, and money raised to go to a good cause. Calvary Academy is having their, their annual rummage sale down in South Milwaukee. We've been part of that for the last many years. If you've got something that is gently used that would be good for a rummage sale, please bring it to the church in the fellowship hall right around the door, and it'll be trucked down there before the rummage sale in June, whenever that is. Um, the last thing was that uh, the, that Luther movie, A Return to Grace, if um, it's been in the bulletin, it's been in the newsletter for, for several months, probably the best opportunity since we're having a, a big trouble, big problem trying to show it at the Paradise Theaters in West Bend, probably the closest opportunity to see that on a big screen is in Menominee Falls. And it's a really good, it's a nice theater because they have those, has anybody ever been down to those theaters? They have the recliners. That's like the best best movie theater ever, but I guess that, that's what all of them are going through, um, but re- big reclining seats, but you can watch that movie, which is a really good introduction to what Lutheranism really is. If you want to, if, if you're not sure what distinguishes Lutheranism from any other church body, or if you can't say that, this is a perfect opportunity to start that, um, but they, they do do it in a little bit different way. You go online, you reserve tickets that way, and you have your tickets, and then you go on the date of the movie, so the the information is all there on the back of your bulletin. 
I believe that's all. You can read the rest for yourself. This is the last day of Sunday school. Um, thanks to our Sunday school teachers. I know Mark's here. Is anybody else here for Sunday school teachers? Got a couple of subs that have served. Who else? Marion has served, yes, all, all year. So thank you, Mark and Marion, for your service once again this year. I'm, I'm convinced that the Sunday school teachers are kind of like the third person in the Trinity. Um, they're the ones that they never get to be put on the pedestal. They don't get paid a lot, which is nothing. Um, but they put a lot of work in. And, and, and so, so we thank them and keep them in our prayers. And we could use another 7th and 8th grade teacher for next year if anybody would like to, to, to take up that role. We could really use a 7th and 8th grade teacher. That's all God's blessings on your week.